So, hello everybody. I hope you're enjoying yourself. Um, my name is uh, Zlatomir. I don't have an entire slide uh, with information about me, but anyway, I'm going to talk, tell, tell you like two words. Uh, I've been working for Codific for about two years, and after the godly talk, I'll draw your attention to things that uh, are used by us, the mere mortals. So, today I'll talk about uh, securing uh, RESTful APIs. And before we start, I would like to make sure that we are all on the same page about what the uh, RESTful API is. And does this work? Okay. So, sorry? Okay. Uh, so, let's imagine that uh, we have uh, our React or Angular application here, where this is the server, uh, here are the clients. We are not going to focus a lot on the clients because it could be our browser, it could be a mobile application, it could be a native application. We don't really care about that. Uh, so our application is uh, loaded on the client and all the uh, communication between the client and the <coughs> server afterwards uh, goes through uh, API calls. So for example, we have a get request that uh, fetches all the comments for the application. Um, so the, let's start with the basics. The first thing about network security is uh, using HTTPS always and everywhere. Uh, today we have services like Let's Encrypt that allow us to uh, have HTTPS for free. It's uh, easily automated and we can use it everywhere. It's absolutely mandatory and if we don't have that, the entire talk makes uh, no sense and it's pointless. So if you don't use HTTPS, you're living in a state of sin and you deserve everything that happens to you. Um, a few more words about the HTTP. Uh, this is uh, a browser tab, as you can see, and the first thing that, uh, the first request that the browser sends to the server when we type a, a, an address, it's actually pure HTTP, it's not HTTPS by default. Uh, what we can do to fix this issue, uh, we can adjust our web server configurations. For example, to the left here, we have a, a simple configuration for the Apache web server. And to the right, we have uh, pretty much the same for the Nginx web server. What this does is to redirect the other traffic to the HTTPS version of your website, of your web application. Um, the good thing about the APIs is that uh, it is called from code, so we don't need to support HTTP on the APIs. We can fully drop the support for HTTP and work only on HTTPS. We can, of course, further lock down the API by enabling uh, HTTPS, but we're not really going to talk about that. Um, the next thing we could do is to implement uh, some rate limits. Uh, why would we do that? Because, for example, there are many websites and services uh, for when we change our passwords and stuff like that. They usually send us to the email some verification code, which is typically six digits or something like that. And if nothing uh, restricts the number of connection that we can do, we can easily brute force that and guess the code. There is actually a HTTP status code for that. It's 429, too many requests, which tells the browser, hey buddy, hold your horses, you have to wait. And we can additionally use the uh, retry after header to tell the client how many seconds it has to wait before it can make another request. This uh, is uh, also a way to prevent uh, uh, denial of service attacks and uh, brute forcing, as I said. And 
the client could use those two headers from the response from the server to somehow not notify the users that, hey buddy, you made too many requests, you have to wait from like in a good looking pop-up or something like that. Okay, which leads us to the next thing for today, lack of uh, proper authorization. How many of you have seen tutorials with head headlines like this? <laughs> yeah, quite some, quite a few people. Yeah, you can't possibly create a secure API in 10 minutes. That's just out of the question. So uh, here is an example from such tutorials where people try to um, access uh, some resources on the server by uh, fetching uh, the objects through some identifier, which is typ typically a number, or so in some cases, uh, uh, more complex strings. But never, uh, nowhere in this example, uh, there is a check if the user who is trying to access that object can actually do that, has the uh, privileges to actually access it. So, and here's another example. You can also m modify, delete, and update such resources that you shouldn't be able to, which is, as you can imagine, a huge, huge problem. Um, so, yeah, you need to implement the proper authorization. You need to check every time somebody tries to access or modify any of your uh, database records or some uh, other objects, if the user can actually do that, if he has the uh, rights to do that. Okay, so next we have this uh, religious uh, war for uh, uh, session uh, objects. So in the traditional web application, we have, uh, we have a backend server and a client where the connection is uh, pretty straightforward. There is nothing uh, we need to worry about. There is, uh, everything is on the server. Everything is good, secure. But what happens when our infrastructure grows? We need to scale things up. And at some point, we have a few backend servers talking to more and more clients. And if we are lucky enough to uh, grow our organizations enough, someday we end up with something like this. This is, we're talking uh, Facebook level, Google level here, where, <coughs> where um, session objects that live on the server is no longer an option. Well, maybe with some session replication and dirty tricks like that, maybe, yeah, but that's not recommended at all. Uh, we'll go into a bit further details, so don't worry. So in this case here, we definitely need um, stateless REST backend. Okay, um, a few more words about that, so it, it's clear to you. Um, these numbers, these uh, circles with numbers, is the uh, session objects or cookies or whatever you like to call them. It's basically the uh, objects on the server that say, okay, when you make a request to the server, the browser sends this cookie to the server and the server checks if, he, it, if it has this object on its uh, drive. If it does, then it's easier to make uh, an authorization decision. Okay, that's John. I know him. I know this guy. I made this uh, session object like five minutes ago. I can let him access all the data. No problem. But when things grow at some point and a stateless backend, we have this case where all the data lives and sits on the client. And as you, can, as you know, um, by default, 
data that comes from the client is untrusted. We can't trust it. So we need to somehow verify that it's legal and uh, we can process it further. How do we do that? Uh, today's uh, standard is uh, basically using uh, JWTs or uh, JSON Web Tokens. And this is an example of uh, such token. Uh, it's, uh, it's not encrypted, it's just uh, Base64 encoded. Um, the interesting part here, I don't know if everybody can see it, but uh, it's not really that important. The interesting part here is the purple one in the middle. It's actually the data that is being sent to the server and that uh, the server need to verify and take some authorization decisions based on that. Uh, the blue part is uh, the actual signature that the uh, server needs to verify that everything is okay. Um, here is, it's an example, it's Java, but it's just like two lines of code. Do you see the potential issue with this code? What could go wrong? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Uh, now, first, I'll show you the, yeah, it's, it's this line here. Now, exactly. Uh, now let me show you the correct way of doing things. It's a bit larger code, but security is important. So this, this uh, example here, actually verifies if the token is valid. While the first one just decodes it and use it straight away, uh, which as I said, it's just base 64 encoded string, so you, we can easily modify it and send to the server whatever you want. Signature verification. <coughs> so do this and do, not that. Um, so, Probably here comes the uh, big religious war uh, between uh, cookies and uh, JWTs. Uh, this is uh, like a standard cookie identifier which has some value. Uh, using 42 is usually not recommended. Use at least three digits. Um, and this is the authorization header used for the JWTs, um, and people usually think that it's the one or the other. You can't use both or you can't some, somehow mix them up, which is actually not quite true. Um, if you think about it, it's, it's just a transport mechanism. So nothing stops us from having the, the token in the cookie or having the cookie identifier in the header. So we can mix them. Um, which leads us to a few things, pros and cons for the, the two options. Um, let's focus on the, the points here at the bottom. So with cookies, uh, we, the browser automatically handles handles them. We, we don't need to write any custom code. It just sees that the browser has a cookie for this website and just automatically sends it to the server. We do nothing. While with uh, JWTs, we have to actually manually write some code that uh, handles all the transport uh, logic and uh, verification and etc. cetera. Um, and the other good thing about cookies is that they also work with uh, DOM resources like images, scripts, uh, CSS, JavaScript. So each time the browser requests an image or a script or something like that, the cookies are also sent back and forth through the network. Uh, and in the case of uh, JWTs, we have to again manually somehow do this with some service workers or uh, somehow. Um, the good thing about authorization headers and JWTs is that, uh, do we have time? Okay. Is that uh, 
it protects us from uh, cross site request forgery attacks, which we are going to talk about in a second. And yeah, I mean, both things have pros and cons. We just have to see what will work best for our case. And here is a small example of uh, what the CSRF attacks is. So let's imagine that this is our browser here on the left, and we have our uh, web application loaded in the first tab, and it does legitimate uh, requests back and forth to the, to the back end. This, the, those are the cookies that are being sent. Um, and somehow the bad attacker hacker guy um, tricks us into opening uh, his malicious uh, website in the second tab of the browser. So when he does that, he could um, make a request to the back end through his uh, malicious uh, website, which is called a forged request. And the browser, as you can see, there is also a cookie here. Uh, the browser has no way to distinguish if the request actually comes from the a web application or from the malicious context. So it will attach the cookie anyway, uh, which uh, will result in a, in a valid request for the backend server. And it also can distinguish if it's a, it's a valid request or not and where it comes from. So this is why people don't like cookies and don't use them pretty much. Um, another thing is uh, cross-site scripting. Uh, I don't really have slides on that but it just basically means that I could uh, inject some arbitrary code in your application and from there on I can do pretty much whatever I want with your application. Um, as you can see, regardless of the session storage mechanism, if you have either XSS or CSRF, it means game over. That's it, you're done. Um, so, ooh. So using cookies requires actually uh, uh, CSRF protection using some strings on the forms and stuff like that. Uh, validation, um, authorization, and so on. While using authorization headers actually requires proper and secure implementation, as you saw a, a few minutes ago, it could go wrong. Don't do that. Um, which leads us to the next thing on the list for today, which is enforcing uh, course policy, which stands for cross origin resource sharing. Uh, we're talking about API, so uh, the first and uh, most important thing that we can do to protect our APIs is to restrict it to use and accept only uh, JSON with uh, a header. Uh, which means that we automatically protect ourselves from uh, CSRF attacks uh, because cookies are sent through uh, submitting forms. If we accept only JSON, we can't submit a form to our API because it, it, it's not in the HTML uh, spec, so we can't do that. And we are automatically protected. Now, um, what we can do with that um, the browser usually sends an option request to some API endpoint with this origin header and ask the server, hey, this is my options request, this is my origin, are you okay with that? And the server returns the proper, the respective uh, uh, response with the respective headers and if everything is okay, the browser proceeds with the next uh, a request which is a put request. Um, the next thing on the list is uh, the actual implementation of the course policies and the origin headers. So for example, this is the value that is being uh, submitted with each request, the, the, with each uh, request and through the header. Um, please, Never ever try to implement course policies yourself. Never. What could go wrong? So if you do something like that, uh, that will bite you, definitely. Why? Because 
everybody can register a domain like this and it, it actually matches one of the conditions and you have a problem or something like this. Never ever do that. Uh, I'll make it easier for you uh, to prevent you from doing that. Imagine that each time you write code like this, little puppies die. Don't do that. And to the more interesting part, how many of you think that this is a, a valid input? One, two, is it? It kind of looks like an, an attempt for SQL injection. And it could be a valid input, who knows? It depends on the, on the logic and what we want to achieve. Um, so the, the note here is if we expect a, a, a number from, as an input, then we have to somehow sanitize it and uh, uh, cast it uh, or something like that. Uh, if we expect, expect a, a date, then we have to do the same for the date field. If uh, we expect the, a text field for a password or a username or email, uh, we need to limit that to, let's say, 100 or 150 characters. We don't usually expect like five megabytes of data for an email. So your, serv your server will be painful. Um, how many of you think that this is a valid email address? Okay, more people, good. Um, Uh, yeah, it's a valid email. Uh, actually, most uh, providers will stop you from uh, sending messages to such email address, even though it's valid. Yeah, so the, the message here is uh, if you apply too strict validation, it could actually result in false positives or some, something will break eventually. And the next thing for today is what do we do when poo goes wrong? Uh, the truth is there is no recipe for fixing things like following step one, two to 10 and bam, all your troubles are gone and everything is okay and we can live happily ever after. Uh, it really depends on your situation. It uh, depends on your structure, on infrastructure, on application. Uh, things that you could possibly do is to split your components uh, so they uh, communicate through some isolated uh, layers or something like that. Or you could, you could uh, if you have authorization, you could put it away from the actual server that uh, gives you the uh, database objects or something like that. It's really no, there's really no recipe for this. It, it depends. And some final words, question everything. Security is about asking questions. And for example, uh, how is the thing we are currently doing different from the one we used to do? Uh, <laughs> that's a funny one. Do we really understand what <coughs> we are doing and have a good grasp of it? And have we validated the integrity and format of the data? You just have to ask questions always and forever. And we have time? Yeah, okay. So if you don't have any questions, that would be all from me. Thank you.